Hi everyone, yes, so my name's Peter Hudson now, my first paragraph has come a little bit defunct. But um, Peter Hudson, there you go. So yeah, I graduated just last year at the Royal College of Art um, from a two year um, masters in design interactions. And um, like a lot of artists I come into contact with in London these days, um, art's not the only thing that they, that they do. So you can tell that from my various other uh, occupations before. Um, as an artist, though, I'm especially interested in person-to-person -person communication uh, and how it's mediated through and impacted by digital technologies, which, given the increasing incorporation of technology into our everyday lives, is a more pertinent and rich subject than ever before. I'm now going to talk about how and why I try to respond to this concern through some of my artworks. Uh, this is Sari. Uh, we met in Strasbourg in France on, uh, on Erasmus. I was studying graphic design and she was studying jewellery. We only met right near the end of the year, but we got on really well. Then, sadly, it was time to say goodbye. We both had to finish our degrees, uh, her in Germany and me in the UK, in Camberwell. Um, then we continued to see each other over Skype, as you can see, and despite ever dodgy internet connections, uh, we managed to keep it up, and with the occasional visit, our relationship actually flourished over that year um, we spent living in our res respective countries. I was amazed at how just, uh, just a few pixels were able to communicate so much. Um, more of what's happening is in your kind of imagination, in that sense, and your kind of mind makes up the rest of what's actually happening in that space. Um, it was frustrating at times, but you know, it kind of uh, it worked out. So when you communicate on Skype, um, you're sort of looking at the other person, but you're, in addition to looking at the person, you're also just looking at the screen. And there's a strange sort of sensation of the other person both being there and very much being not there. Um, and in addition, you know, we make so many connections um, and consume so much imagery via the screen. Um, so much complex emotion is read through what is sometimes just a really small window. So I'm really intrigued by our relationship with and our reliance upon the screen in general. Although there are lots of like, negative connotations associated um, with staring at screens, um, I don't really want to be negative, but I do want to sort of probe the issue in our relationship. Um, after all, it helped me personally in my personal relationship. We're still together, by the way, which is good. <laughs> um, so I wanted to translate this kind of intimacy of these just few pixels into something tangible and create something to probe this relationship and to communicate it. So um, eye contact is uh, a pretty universal form of communication for humans. Well, and animals, I guess. Um, the eyes provide both a way to read the world and a way to be read by others. They're an arresting image and a symbol of perception. So I used the motif of eyes to create this installation at the Welcome Collection to communicate to passers-by on Euston Road. I wanted to use pixelation in a way that would question people's own perception of the eyes staring out in front of them and make them acutely aware of the mediation of the screen. Up close, the display appears as a barely discernible, discernible flickering mosaic. Each pixel is about a foot squared in size, and uh, they're illuminated um, with an array of 24 LEDs each, about 16,000 in total, which projects onto a dark rear projection vinyl that was applied to the inside of the windows, which helped make it visible during the daytime uh, and to create the kind of warm um, skin tones, uh, or skin-like tones. Um, it was also important that the pixels had sort of soft edges, as I wanted the interaction to be with the texture and the feel of the screen, um, without reading into too much what the image was. Um, so Euston Road is, is really wide. So from the other side, um, the pairs of eyes were kind of instantly discernible. And uh, if you take a picture with your phone, it would become even smaller, to the point where you barely notice the, um, the resolution at all. 
Um, the irons, when situated in the window, uh, almost make the building into a body. So I decided to use the eyes of the Welcome Trust staff for the content. I filmed about 70 members of the staff from all levels of the organization, from receptionists to senior figures. Um, and I asked each of them to go through a series of eye movements. I talked to them and asked questions in order to sort of stimulate um, a variety of different eye movements and expressions. Also, um, I asked them to close their eyes and relax for several minutes. And um, some of them uh, were on breaks from work and they, they really enjoyed that quite a lot. <laughs> um, but it enabled me to um, program the display so that the eyes could go to sleep at night, uh, only to be woken up by the movement of a uh, passerby. So the next project um, I want to tell you about, I'll leave that up. Is, um, is my graduating project from the Royal College of Art. Um, it's an attempt to probe the subject of human communication, uh, but this time in a more sort of applied philosophical sense. I first came into contact with philosophy uh, during my A-levels um, a few years ago, um, <laughs> and I was hugely kind of impacted by it. It's, um, you know, we started off with uh, Descartes' meditations, um, but like, after we covered doubting the external world, which obviously everyone kind of knows about, I sort of lost interest after that. Everything seemed a bit, triv um, a bit trivial. And um, I just never really got past the whole does everything actually exist thing. Um, and so, thus far, 21st century culture is centered on interaction. I communicate, therefore I am, is the defining affirmation of contemporary existence. Um, I find this quote um, to be quite moving in a way. Uh, to me, it expresses the idea that communication is more like an act of persisting in the world. And the fact connectivity is so ubiquitous drives the need to both be noticed and, and, aware, of, uh, and aware of others. Um, so a few years ago, I was reading the Wind Up Bird Chronicles by Haruki Murakami as another inspiration point for this project. Um, the story's protagonist uh, is going through what seems like a marriage breakdown and his world is beginning to distort around him. Um, early on in the book, he goes, on, uh, he goes to the end of his garden and discovers a deep well. Then, on several occasions during the course of events, he climbs down the well to sit at the bottom in total darkness, uh, totally alone. I found this also to be quite a seductive idea. Um, that there could exist a space um, where you can retreat to and be totally alone, almost like a kind of uh, parallel universe. So, being undetectable um, is the name of the project. It's the creation and exploration of a completely removed private enclosure situated within a public space. Upon entering, the occupant's entire perceptual landscape is limited entirely to themselves. Because spaces where, spaces where you aren't monitored, um, particularly in cities, are increasingly eroding away, and they're hard to find. And even when it is possible um, to have a kind of moment of isolation, uh, people still try to remain connected um, via phones, like even on the toilet, for example. Um, I don't know, just me? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the booth itself, Oh, it's a little bit dark on that, but I've got some other ones after. Uh, is a black rubber-clad cube with half-meter thick uh, metal-lined walls and a door. It aimed to prevent acoustic transmission and all forms of digital communication to create a kind of other dimension inside. Well, that was the dream, but um, anyone involved in physics knows that a kind of, that sort of information-proof box um, is uh, practically impossible to, to create. So in reality, it's more like a vehicle for exploring the extent to which communication and observation define contemporary existence. Um, kind of to create a, an immersive experience for the occupant and a thought provocation for onlookers. Um, there is a handle uh, on the inside of the door, so it can be pulled to, but none on the outside. So that in theory, once someone is inside, although, that's an exceptional example. Once someone's inside, they're inaccessible and uncontactable and in total control of how long they remain in that state. 
I didn't give anyone any instruction as to what to think about whilst inside, as I wanted it to be a completely free space, where you were just you on your own. It's a rarer and rarer sensation to just have nothing to do. You know, you kind of constantly have um, somewhere you've got to be or somewhere you've got to go, but this was kind of the idea to create a space where it's just pointless <laughs> in a way. <laughs> Um, you know, where there's no, there's, no, there's no task that you have to do. So, because um, I felt that that space was sort of sacred, it seemed important not to ask people afterwards, like, what they, um, what they were thinking about inside. But I did want to connect people with their experiences. Um, so, I um, took pictures of them while they were inside. Uh, this is Nick. Uh, this is Kim Lee. Uh, this is James. He's uh, an ex-tutor. And uh, this is uh, Elona. It was raining that day. <laughs> um, so uh, they genuinely are those people as well, I promise. They're sort of, it's a kind of an anti-portrait. So where the subject of the photo is in the metadata of the image. Um, and I would give people the, um, their anti-portraits um, when, they, when they left <laughs> um, afterwards as a little memento. So they can sort of connect to their experience inside without it being kind of directly recorded. So it's more of a kind of way of just, yeah, connecting to their um, uh, isolation. Um, and it kind of compounds the whole idea of the project in the first place, which is that you, you don't know what's happening inside when the, once the door's closed. It was dark. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, so, um, so what I thought would be um, nice is, oh, wait a sec, um, is, yeah, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about, briefly about my project um, that is downstairs in the cafe for you to have a look at later. Um, so I'm trying to create generally interactive installations where the focus is on the interaction itself um, and that the actual interaction is the sort of artwork. So it's like creating frameworks uh, or systems for an experience. So when I had the um, honor of being invited to be artist in residence at the Courtauld, um, I took a tour around the building for the first time uh, ever and found all the corridors, corridors and the seminar rooms were sort of lined with, um, lined with paintings and drawings um, and there was just, there was a lot, but there was nothing in the cafe. And that kind of surprised me a little bit. Um, because, and, and the fact that it's kind of relatively busy there, I thought that that'd be an interesting place to, to install. So Open It um, is an invitation to interact physically with the artwork. Um, a lot of my projects have involved boxes in some way. Um, and there's just something that is quite compelling about them. You never really know, you never really know what's inside. Um, you either kind of have your expectations confirmed or you're surprised. So the way this um, installation works is to give you something unexpected every time you engage with it. Each interaction is, uh, so opening, literally lifting the lid, is recorded um, and then added to a continually expanding archive of content. Each time you open it, you see one of those interactions. A randomly chosen one. Is that me? Um, <laughs> a little bit of free dancing. Um, yes, yeah, so there is a kind of trade off, um, much in the same way that our interactions uh, in the internet, uh, like on the internet, um, rather, have a sort of cost. So when you access um, websites, you are also kind of recorded yourself. Um, and you kind of give away your own data just by accessing things. Um, there's also a kind of sense of intimacy and almost kind of uh, voyeurism, that you're somehow seeing a person uh, quite close up in a very similar um, position to yourself, uh, knowing that they've done exactly the same thing that you've done just before. Um, so I'll leave you with just a few of the Interactions recorded so far.
Thank you very much.